The testing of atomic weapons and long-range missiles had a huge impact on Australia's far western desert areas during the 1950s and 60s, including terrible consequences for those who ended up in harm's way. The rocket range covered a huge area of the Australian outback, with the launch site at Woomera in South Australia and the line of fire continuing all the way to the Indian Ocean just south of Broome. Army surveyor Len Bedell was chosen to develop a road network to service the rocket range and the atomic bomb testing areas. His network of tracks and trails continues to be the primary access into this remote desert country. In July 2022, a group of us led by Ron Moon set off to retrace many of these iconic atomic roads. The main east-west road, built by Len and named after his wife, is the Anne Bedell Highway. The road, built in stages from 1953 to 1962, is the anchor from which many of the other rocket roads lead. We started our traverse of the Anne Bedell after resupplying in Cuba Pedy, before heading to the road start point at the Mabel Creek Station Road Junction. Our plan was to cover the 1300 odd kilometres along the Anne Bedell Highway over six days, with five separate permits necessary to cover the route. Our initial run took us over reasonably wide and well graded roads westward from Mabel Creek to the dog fence. Strangely, the gate in the fence is offset from the main road by around three kilometres, so a detour track runs down and back beside the fence. From the dog fence, the track becomes noticeably rougher, narrower and more overgrown. It remained that way until we found camp at Tallaringa Well. Tallaringa was originally a native soak found by Richard Morris in 1897 and used by him on several expeditions. The well was rediscovered by Bedell and partly restored by him and his team, though it is now full of silt and debris. We camped near the well and then started day two, packing and heading out on a cold morning at minus six degrees. We continued westward, our next destination being Emu Field. We exited the Tallaringa Conservation Park into lands managed by the Maralinga Chiracha Oak Valley Rangers. The turn to enter Emu Field is scantily marked when you consider how significant the totem atomic test blasts were and the history of this iconic place. We visited both of the blast sites, each marked by a concrete obelisk and surrounded by debris, including sand that had been melted into small glass beads. My mind is made of the section of road from Kuba Pedy to Emu was constructed in 1953 
prior to formation of the famous Gun Barrel Road Construction Party. Whenever you want me to, I don't want anyone else, cause I know there's not anyone The next 50 kilometre section, built in 1956, terminates at Ants Corner, the junction with the Mount Davies Road, which heads to the northwest. We made camp near Rand's Corner, amongst the trackside mulga and black oaks. West of Emu, the road gets much more corrugated and overgrown reflecting the reduced use and maintenance of the track once you get past the atomic test site. Well, good morning guys, day three on the Anne Vidal Highway. Um, we just camped off the track last night. <coughs> and by the end of the day we expect to be at the Western Australian border give or take. Um, we're in red sand dune country now so the road's quite a bit better. When we were in the ironstone sort of pebble areas the corrugations were quite bad. It's uh, on the sand, certainly livable. Um, in terms of tyre pressures on the front and in the trailer um, running 20 psi cold and they come up to about 24 during the day and on the rear axle which is the most heavily loaded um, running 24 pound cold and they come up to 28 even up to 30 pound once the, uh, the heat gets into them from working over these corrugations it uh, wasn't so bad last night, but not before it was minus six. But this morning was about two or three degrees, which is a big difference. And uh, yeah, we sort of got a head down, just trying to cover a few miles this morning. And uh, looking forward to another day on the Anvidel Highway. There are broken and abandoned trailers all along the Anvidel Highway, testimony to this track's relentless punishment. We followed the sun tracking to the west and soon the Anbadel Highway entered the Mamangari Conservation Park, although the signs weren't updated, still calling it an unnamed park. We pushed onward over 110 kilometres of deteriorating track to reach Vokes Hill Corner, from which a track heads south to intersect at Cook, a siding on the Trans-Australian Railway.
The track was still pretty rugged and unmaintained, with horrible corrugations and scrub so tight to the track that I had to run with the side mirrors fully folded in, in order to protect them from the clawing branches. The countryside and the track condition vary through the day, at times running on smooth sandy tracks flowing between red sand dunes. Then it can turn into hard corrugated ironstone alleyways threading through narrow scrub. With the sun getting low, we found a clear area beside the track to camp, amongst the dunes. Overnight showers settled the dust and really made the desert's colours pop under the morning sun. We set off for our fourth day on the Amberdell, with another rain shower passing through. and yet another victim of this rugged track, a relatively new trailer too. We later found out that this King's Camper trailer was recovered. It's a shame some of the other broken trailers weren't also removed from the track. We reach the Serpentine Lakes under clearing skies. And from here you can see why Len Bedell was concerned the lakes would become an obstacle in wet weather. The clay pan surface would easily become boggy. Reaching western side of the lake bed meant we'd also arrived at the South Australia-West Australia border, complete with another Bedell plaque. This meant we were now travelling across land of the Spinifex people and were under conditions of yet another transit permit. Crossing into Western Australia brought an immediate improvement in quality of the track and also the facilities made available for travellers.
time for a little bit of maintenance as you often have to do on these sort of tracks the right rear tire pressure monitoring sensor stopped transmitting so I'm hoping it's just a battery and we've got plenty of spare batteries for that and luckily the batteries for these are the same as for the key remote control for the Land Cruiser so that's handy anyway we'll change the battery over and then test it in terms of some of the other little repairs um, one of the rear car shock absorber stone guards came loose I noticed the left shocky on the T-band looks like it's got a little bit of oil mist from the piston rod seal and it's getting quite hot um, spotlight mount had to tighten but other than that we're doing pretty well compared to some people um, and of course except for that bloody fencing wire that got tangled around the back wheel and damaged the mudguard which I'm still not happy about um, some of the other vehicles and campers have had bash plates come loose um, spare wheel carriers on the back of their trailers break um, yeah warnings ripped off nearly a whole range of other issues but touch wood so far our rig's going pretty well anyway I'll change this battery and we'll plug it in and hopefully we've got a fix As simple as that. I run the Safety Dave monitoring system and they give you spare batteries, spare O-rings, and carry bag. They do supply lock nuts but I don't run them because it makes it too hard to take the sensors off and on when you're um, airing up and airing down. Anyway, I'll put him back on, see how we go. Now one of the problems with tire pressure monitoring sensors, external type, on corrugations is the valve stem vibrates. And you can see it's worn quite a large groove into the wheel. It happens especially on the rear axle, I think being the live axle. And I run these um, bits of foam rubber to try and help prevent it. And that's what they end up looking like, pretty chopped up. Put the two of them there for comparison. So they do last a while, but eventually they fall apart as well. With rain showers still hovering around, we took advantage of one of the shelter sheds to make camp. The next morning, day five broke cool and clear, and we continued our way across the orange dunes of the Great Victoria Desert. We soon reached Ilkelka Roadhouse, the first supply point since leaving Cooper Pedy 800 kilometres ago. The Ilkelka store has basic grocery and hardware supplies, plus diesel at $3.65 per litre, which was the most expensive we'd encountered on the trip, but you can understand it when this is Australia's most remote fuel station. We continued along and by mid-afternoon reached the iconic Neal Junction at intersection of the Anne Bedell and Connie Sioux Highways. 
Towards end of the Gun Barrel Road construction period, the Connie Sioux Highway became an important north-south route in the Western Desert, linking Warburton in the north through to Rulina siding on the Trans-Australian Railway at the south. Our last night's camp on the Amberdell was made amongst a maze of dunes with another cool clear day forecast ahead. A little along the track, in this remote corner of the desert, we found a sombre little memorial plaque for Anne Bedell, whose name the track honours. The Anne Bedell started to wander a little as it came through jump up country, and we found ourselves weaving between rock outcrops that included the tallest, Bishop Riley's pulpit. Our final landmark on the crossing is Yo Lake, both a nature reserve and an old abandoned homestead. The homestead would make an ideal campsite, but we had more miles to cover. Those wanting the complete Anne Bedell Highway experience would continue 230 kilometres further to the west, ending at Laverton. We turned north at Yale Lake onto Sunday Point Road and then continued to the Great Central Road for next leg of our trip. More information on this and some of our other trips can be found on our blog at travelling2.com.au. For the next leg of this adventure, follow us up the David Carnegie Road. See you out there.